attention. Please stay on the screen once more. This is the automated cover for the universe of sign of the Pirates. I repeat, please stay on the screen once more. This is not a drill. This is an attack warning. An actual attack is taking place against the universe. Red car. All worlds have sustained normal operations. The protective actions should be taken immediately by all seasons and forces. All orders are allowed to back up immediately. I repeat, all world orders are to back up immediately. All orders are ordered to cease development actions until further notice of the appropriate authorities of the universe. You are listening to the emergency broadcast system sounding the sign on the world's order.
It was a conflagration which destroyed us. Not any one element, but fragments of unsettled scores. There's no real defense against that. easy to take, and it seemed like we'd always have a supply. A goodwill gift, shipped on freighters, marvelous to behold. It wasn't long before we got greedy, turned their gift into a commodity up for bids. That's how it started.
the 12, I'm going to need you to maintain the down vector. That's it. 64 degree. Mark. I come up on the 86. Weld 6. Position 3 rivets. Dexter side. Mark. Unit 19, Port Sector 6, Periphery,
it was by no random coincidence or stroke of bad luck that we found ourselves facing a shortage. What we didn't even know existed a year earlier had become the focal point of a global need. How did it happen? When the first freighter visited, it was all very proper. First contact, the semblance of trust, and the gift. Technology as a gift. What we didn't really perceive was that the freighter was like an ice cream truck making the rounds. We just happened to be on its new route. We should have asked for references, asked to see some evidence of how the trek had helped other worlds. But that might have been insulting. And they probably would have faked it anyway. So, we had half a year of progress and groundbreaking. Then Africa reported they had used up their allotment. Then South America. Then Australia. It took clones to actually handle the raw trek. Our visiting friends were already familiar with our DNA. And they showed techniques for adjusting it accordingly. Those who raised warning signs were seen as alarmist fringe elements. Eventually, they were routinely jailed. And it really didn't matter. Our own procedures didn't matter. Our visitors knew what lay ahead as soon as we accepted their gift. Brother 12, it's been a while. You think you have a chance for a few words of wisdom? I could use something. Trek's a little low, and I just, I just need to sit back and listen to a real voice. Tell me anything. Tell me about options. Are you there? <laughs> Just tell me a story. The future is like the end of a rope which leads out into the fog. The future is a blurred construct. The future is a moving target. To assemble our own days and stack them 
so that we think they're leading toward a point is so often proven to be utterly false, wrong, and misleading. You can have a beautiful baby that grows up to be an absolute handful. You could start a promising project that utterly fizzles. Or you could start a fizzling project that utterly pans out. And because the future is in the fog and a moving target, can't take ourselves too seriously sometimes when we make plans for it. Sometimes the plans of years gone by for the future are just made mockeries of by elements of the coming present as it develops. We do have some lines that go out there though into that fog. Lines of our own character that are not likely to change with any given future scenario, except some. And let's explore that. I wouldn't want to jump the gun and take it to the doomsday scenario to see how some people's character, otherwise solid and strong, might change for survival, either of themselves or their family and their loved ones. Sometimes it doesn't take doomsday for everyone but just doomsday for the individual stock market, your investments are gone. You're finding yourself with uh, untenable living situations. You're in a divorce, you're in nasty arguments, you're in a court case. Suddenly that person who was stable and reliable becomes erratic. Their thoughts become jammed. Their hopes seem gone. What do you build on to build into the future? I think so many times, in so many ways, you have to face the future naked. You can't bring all that luggage with you. It'll appear there. It might be shipped for you. You might find yourself in the future with baggage. But there are some things you cannot specifically bring. Almost like that time travel principle within the Terminator and other science fiction stuff. You face the future naked. Your hopes, your dreams, the aspirations that you have, and the work that you've done to build yourself there is in a different world, it's in a different sphere of evolution. Once that time passes, once you go from point A to point B, and there may be no signs on the bridge that gets you there. Maybe no warnings and certainly no exits, save for one. Reconciling what we have today as valuable to us for the future. It has to be some basic things. Family, children, loved ones. Even that, as close as we might hold them to our hearts, even that subject to change, put on the table, made as a wager. The variables which could affect them are many, whether they are accidental, whether they're evolutionary, as far as a person's evolution goes, or whether they're by other people coming in to that life and taking. Is pruning a tree taking? Is it all part of garden structure? If what you prune is later on the campfire to start a jolly evening for someone else, was it doing the tree more good? Or can the tree grow now in fuller ways? So we can build our hopeful highways into that fog of the future. 
And we can say with reasonable certainty that some things won't change. But we have to have an idea of where those border lines are, where the boundaries between what we probably could control and what we probably can't. We can make decisions today, obviously, which greatly and adversely affect our futures. But to predict the ultimate outcome of those decisions, it's more of a prognostication, it's more of a mesmerization of ourselves, almost. Because all the other variables and factors out there shifting in a heavy swirl of the sea of the future could easily capsize whatever little vessel you send out there. Even though you tested it to be seaworthy in the bathtub of your own presence, it might prove to be something less than that once you set it adrift in the larger sea. So we have these things, and they are what give us certain confidences. They are what help us form the emotional strength that we need to face difficult days and times and trials, knowing somehow that those things are not everlasting. And if you're having a bad day, chances are, at some point, it'll turn around, even if it's by slow degrees. And a good day will come along. The system of rewards which we allow ourselves, the promise and hopefulness which we give ourselves or take away. It's a subtle acknowledgement of the impermanence of everything. Although we tend to look at it as something different. We tend to have sometimes neater and sometimes more mystical explanations for why these things go down that way and how they evolve and how they turn and come around again. Chaos is part of nature. And again, you're faced with the philosophy that <clears throat> everything is planned out. Perhaps everything has happened before. The universe expands to a point where it doesn't expand anymore, then it contracts to a point where it can't contract anymore, and then another big bang, and worlds form again, and who's to say they haven't formed this way before? If I say to you, bright man, promising man, intelligent woman, expectation laid out before you, like steps that you have to climb. The collar is heavier. With each step you make, we knew you could do it. We have such high hopes for you. The collar is heavier. You prove them silently correct, even if you were to retreat from their constructed system, even if you were to forge your own path go your own way. They would say he did it by himself. Look at her. She's a dynamo. She can handle anything. Why? Why does the hero aspect need to invade our interpersonal lives? Can it be an escape valve and limited to that? A disaster happens. People are rescued. Are they rescued by other people? Or are they rescued by heroes? Heroes which swoop from the sky, born whole and complete from the brain of some goddess. Heroes. It's a self-masochistic kind of thing. Why? Don't people rescue people? Don't people do great things? No, it's heroes. And it's the weight. And it's the collar. 
why should there be such to that degree it's a form of celebrity perhaps a purer form that more people can get behind and believe in but it's still a facade it's still something that we like to put over the lenses we use to see how we work who would like to think that Joe Schmo on the volunteer fire department who pulled an old lady out of a house and suddenly became a hero has a gambling problem or he smacked his wife last month who would like to hear that no he has to be a hero we don't want to hear about the other stuff that he's done we just want to hear how many old ladies he's pulled out of burning buildings? You'd buy him lunch. If you had the extra money, if it was your proprietorship, it's on the house, hero. And why? Might as well just pick a random person. Because they have the capacity just as much as that guy. It might take a more unique set of circumstances to bring it out. It's the biggest difference. We asked our visitors if there was a way to make the trek a renewable resource. No doubt scientists were eager to experiment. But somewhere along the line, it seemed our question was taken as a request. Wouldn't surprise me if it was intentionally, conveniently misinterpreted. So one day, our visitors tell us that in accordance with our wishes, they've incorporated technology into a couple dozen crop locations around the world. It was said that the governments of different countries were hotly vying for the honor of having some of their farms become laboratories, more highly sought than hosting the Olympics. How do we get it out? We should have asked. Maybe some of us tried to ask it. But of course, it couldn't be done. When it was much too late, we tried. After the visitors left, increased birth defects began. They weren't particularly high in the areas where the trek crops were grown. But in the cities, transportation hubs, centers of commerce, and large gatherings of civilization in general, they took it worst. The clone program only began in earnest after sterilization became prevalent. So, there are three worlds, and there's only three in all the blim blam universe. I'll tell you what they are. There's the world that you're in now, the things you've surrounded yourself with, physically, mentally, the 
the personnel of your life. I know that's a cold term. There's what you left behind to get to where you are. That comprises a world of its own. Whether it's learning experiences that have taught you lessons that have helped you move forward, or whether it's actually people and friends and places, all the way down to materials and devices that are gone from your life or too far away to be reached. And finally, there's the world that you don't know about. There's the thing that's around the corner. It could be a monster with claws, or it could be a smiling friend. Most of the time, we're in here and now world mode. We negotiate what we have, and perhaps the best of us, at times when we're reflective enough, when we're thoughtful enough, can keep in mind the road markers from behind, the path that we took to get to where we are, and use that as guideposts for where we want to be or would like to be. I think when you face a lot of the stringent aspects of where we are, and you look at their composition, you'll find that it's a meaty amalgam. It's, it's nothing so neatly laced. It's something that a kid pushed together like clay because we can't do fine precision operations with our lives. At best, we have these moments of precision amidst a large sea of approximation. And that's what carries us forward. The moments of precision perhaps lend us some clarity, those epiphanies which we get. But it's those big lumps of clay of different colors pushed together and smushed together and all swirling within each other. That's what we can really make. That's our skill level, so to speak, because we can't really get and probably don't really want the kind of surgical clarity that would let somebody suddenly morph into a Vulcan and look at it all with logic, because that's not the way to live. Perhaps the way to get to the unknown universe of the future is to more and more accept the fact that there will be gaps in your reasoning, gaps in your logic, that the more you know, the less you know, and that every little tidbit that you file away, file away in your brain, something gets bumped off the cliff. So do we live on the land or the abyss? Do we try to recall these things? Suddenly deja vu comes in, something we haven't thought of in years. Or we're lying right on the fringe of sleep, and a memory comes unbidden that hadn't entered our minds since we were kids. Are those auguries? Are those little signposts and omens that try to tell us something? that get interpreted through the wavelengths of dreams and become themselves animated creatures within the soulscape of what we live. Some call them demons, you see. It's as good a name as any, because when things resurface, depending on how you dwell on things depending on the life that you've had and the regrets and the things that you kick yourself for and how hard you are on yourself they may very well manifest in a form that could best be called demons and when they come to visit you in your present world they are not strictly ghosts of the past they are not limited to one other world they are like that amalgam, that mushing together of clay, remnants of the past, a little bit of where you are so you can relate better, and then the unknown element of the future, a visitation upon you of thoughts which could be uneasy, thoughts which you do not know how to classify right away. And it's that mis-ease of classification, that, that thing that takes us time to figure out, that we're very leery about that we approach with um, sometimes caution, sometimes disdain and mistrust. We are, by nature, mistrustful. Now that comes from pain, 
that's rooted in the past, clearly. We cannot predict that we will be done wrong in the future, so we have no reason to mistrust any specific instance in the future, which is why pitfalls arise and you can walk right into them. However, when they slip past that threshold and they become part of the past, then they can be the signposts and warnings which scream in your mind. Now, is their screaming relevant and useful for the most part? Or are they preventing you from taking steps on a path that might prove to be the most rewarding? I think if you look at what really would be a list, if you had to comprise one, if you have the time on a lazy Sunday afternoon and there was not much interesting in the paper, more news of death and disaster, you already done the crossword, and you sit and you comprise a list, call it signposts, road marks, those things. Well, these don't necessarily have to be moments of great import. These could be little things which just leave some questions, little things which are not resolved and haunt and come back and have, have a life of their own that sort of springs up like a ghost of fog out of the grounds and moors of our thoughts. If we can try to have a seance with them, if we can try to tune out the present, that current world that surrounds us with the blaring horns and the yapping and the demands and the televisions and everybody trying to get you to buy something. If we can let that fade, something else becomes clearer. There is never true silence. In the universe, you could think, dead silent, hear a pin drop. That's your range, perhaps, but there is never true silence. There is always something. And being attuned to your own past, the world that you left behind, could be the guide marker just a little bit. It can't be anything more than a little bit for where you might go. Supposed to be. And then the neat little actuator that allows the O rings to open up and the solution to come up into the area where the plant was stored. And there's different tubes with different solutions, and each of these plants um, is of some different genetic strain of the plant. So they know exactly what they want to see um, within each solution and within each type of plant.
what we had was about 40% of blessing and 60% of curse. New crop technology allowed us to feed everyone. Sounds great. We went for it with gusto. 12 trek farms turned into a hundred, then a thousand. But the levels were dropping. You see, trek stagnates and weakens the more times it's produced from a single original supply. It's relatively slow, and it takes months for the levels to show any change at all. But once it starts dropping, there's no getting it back. Our visitors with their galactic ice cream truck knew this, but of course, didn't really tell us. They just hinted that there were other varieties of Trek. It's obvious now that these variants are necessary to maintain potency levels. It was probably designed that way. And once you've ingested a few doses of Trek, whether it's in produce or just an innocent glass of water, two main things happen. First is, you feel fine. The second is, you become sterile, and you need to maintain about the same level of dosage. Failure to do this shows effects similar to starvation. Your organs begin shutting down, and you've had it. I guess the idea is to maintain a select breeding population, free from Trek, and to distribute Trek crops to the third world. But that wasn't written in any instructions. For a long time, it wasn't even suggested. Here's the part that generates a lot of conflicted opinions about our saviors. They returned early, very concerned and very apologetic. It seems they had taken some human volunteers on board their freighter. They noticed how the trek was affecting them. They were embarrassed and ashamed, they said. The Trek had not made any other species sterile. Then, they fixed it. They actually fixed it. They gave us the full variety of Trek strains, plus an additive they had made, which adjusted it for human consumption. Here was the solution to world hunger crops could grow in the desert, cheaply, plentifully. They didn't ask for any form of payment, and pretty much just kept apologizing. I wonder how many had been lost while they did their cosmic U-turn. Oh, there was just one thing. A question, really. 
Some of their freighters were undermanned. The trek was such a success, such a helpful thing. They could barely keep up, and their government had other funding concerns. So would anyone be interested in simply traveling with the cargo to new worlds? Pressing a few buttons, seeing that deliveries went smooth and friendly. You can imagine how many they had to turn away. Sometimes it could only be right that we'd be given a chance to walk in the sun. We're creatures of shade, though. We live in grays. Dream of black and whites. Simplicity of true love. Problems being totally solved. Money being able to be the end to worry. Black and white. Look into the stony face of the situations that the world presents you. And all you see is a gray death god. Dreaming of black and whites. Having muddled dreams where the edges of mystery swirl like cream within coffee, slowly blending until you have something that's on a color palette foreign to you. To watch the bright streamers of others' ideals being upheld, being achieved. To look at that as some sort of taunting example. Too often it's not that way, and it plays itself out as if it wants to play that trick on you. You're attributing characteristics to the functions of a system. You're assigning names to the spokes on the cogwheels of fate. And really they're random and not clear. But in time, I think it's possible to know how some of them function slightly different than others. You'll agree that the randomness of life is not so seemingly scattershot as we're sometimes led to think. It's not always a mixing bowl melange or whatever happens to crawl out of the ooze and managing to survive. We can still find that in the natural world sometimes, but more often, in the synthetic boxes that we make, there are tampered with rules. There are shades of the gray that perhaps we didn't expect. It's one thing to Adapt yourself from the mentality of childhood. The right and the wrong and the good and the bad and the evil and everything. Then seeing it. Monster under the bed may, may not be so bad. The reward that you get, that sticker on your forehead, might not be so good. Walking with ourselves in search of a companion do we need to know ourselves first? Or can we discover ourselves within the eyes of another? Again with the gray. If you can get your mind into a soft and quiet place where it envisions flowing fields and bright kingdoms, and use that as your mantra, use that as your panic room, 
for dealing with the world? Have you not perpetrated a fraud upon yourself? Have you not simply shut down other parts of your mind in favor of a temporary lobotomy? Some people deal so well. Some people cope with diversity as if it's water rolling off their back. And you have to wonder, in some instances with those people, what brand, what manner of psychological implements have they bestowed, enacted, perpetrated upon themselves in order to simply focus on narrow spectrums. As for me, what I like is people who have the depth to soar high and to plunge low. Much as I would preach an even keel to somebody who is plunging low, much as I would try to level that flight in the big picture, too much of an even keel, too much of a level flight, and you miss things. And the trick that's played upon you when you miss things isn't any particular thing that you missed. It's time passing. The things themselves are somewhat less important in the overall picture of allowing time to pass while your mind is half asleep. So we try. We build our gaunt and fraudulent structures of personal support. We have our networks that we think are invaluable to us, but aren't really available to us, aren't really ours. Don't have our names stamped or carved into the architecture anywhere on them. Yet we tell ourselves these are the closest thing to ours. Friends. Friends can be pillars. Friends can be walking sticks to get you through that tricky bit of forest. Spouses, lovers, hopeful mates. They're wavelengths, sometimes in harmony, sometimes out of tune with your own. But time, time like an orchestra practicing, you might find they can be closer than you think. The adaptive ability, not of our biology, but of our understanding, of our mental chemistry, of our psyche. Sometimes it's on a very slow timer. And you can go years, you can go a couple of decades with an established routine, with a comfortable groove with a schedule for the days and weeks and months of your life that is palatable, that you have no great distaste with. And then, over a span of weeks or months or years, the tide shifts. The ocean calls to you. The tide pools form. And you wonder what would it be like if I jumped from the shore to the water? Or vice versa, what would it be like if I swam from the water to the shore? Once you're there, how long do you have? How long could any mindset last without that shutting down that we were talking about, that narrowing of spectrums, that focusing? Think of the, the farm couple. Survival dedicated to the work. The work being dawn to dusk. Not just for one spouse, but for both. Survival, narrowing, focusing. Pride, pride that comes with accomplishing and doing for yourself. But also, loss. Making the choices 
which narrow your spectrums are valid choices in and of themselves. However, time, the great leveler, when it's introduced, when it's offsetting those choices, you do have a scale which can sometimes tip in a favor rather displeasing to you. So do you push through and go on? Do you say to yourself, I have invested in this path beyond the point of no return, or beyond the fail-safe point of where my life trajectory is taking me, and to change now is too much? Or, do you say your life could end at any moment? A beam from this house could collapse and hit me on the head. I could uh, get struck by a car, I could get into an accident. Wild bear could chew my head off and realize that every day is a world. You fall into a trap that way too. The short thinkers, the ones who live for the moment, the surfer dudes who only want to catch the wave, the bachelors who only want to go to the bar that night and pick up a one night stand. Categories, you sometimes have to share them with unpleasant bedfellows. Then do you further compartmentalize? Do you further narrow down that spectrum and say, no, I belong to subcategory 33J of the unpleasant bedfellow scenario. So I don't have to do this particular thing, but it's the other things I'll engage in. That fine tuning of the symphony of your life is up to you. Nobody can tell you how to do it and nobody can sell you a tuner for it. All the manuals that are out there, all the self-help books, all the how-to's. How-to's for who? Maybe how-to's for the person who wrote it and for people like the person who wrote it. I'm not sure I'd want to meet them. I don't think I'd want to stand in line at Arby's with them. No. The how-to's are the little voices, the ones that aren't in black and white, the ones that aren't written down on 300 pages, ready for sale on a shelf. The how-to's are internal, and they're echoes. They aren't strong, every now and then maybe, but for the most part, they're the little whispers in the dark of your mind, and you wonder, are they ghosts, are they specters, or are they really good conscience and best interest. I don't claim to know or have any great ability to differentiate between the maelstrom of advice I might give myself, the things that form the patterns of my thoughts, but I do know that with persistence and with a sustained feeling, it's a good indicator of something I need to seriously consider. Your day can be gray, and not in a bad way. Your day can incorporate things. The highs, the lows, they're great, but to always have them close together, to be going from the high to the low, back to the high, with no plateau, then you've got a problem, as much of a problem as somebody who's on a rather constant plateau. No matter what the level is, you could be lifestyles of the rich and famous. You could be eating caviar out of oyster shells, whatever you like. It's gonna lose its luster. Conversely, if you spend a lot of time in poverty, Little things will seem like luxuries. The spectrums, the wavelengths, the navigational territories that we have. Captains of your ship. Looking within that. The little Lego pieces which make up any given set of decisions that you might make to steer the course of your life. I would sit 
in opium dens if I could. I would dream with people who are relics of what they could be, who are wasted to points where all they can do is babble philosophies that they could never achieve. How good is their structural integrity? Which ones are going to fail? It's not always the ones carrying the most weight. It's not always the ones at the bottom. And I would listen. I would listen to them more keenly, sharply, and clearly than I would the smartest of lectures. A lot of the times, if not most of the times, it's the ones at the top. When you've fashioned this monstrosity into a tilting thing, into a behemoth, that you wonder, how did you get there? You know, why is the 35th floor of this thing lopsided? And as you're wondering, off come the top 20 floors. When you have the guy in the three-piece suit, the tie, standing on the lectern, on that podium, on that desk, looking at the crowd, making the eye contact, doing everything that Emily Post might want. Would it have been a proper reconcilement of that situation? To say, scrap this. He's representing himself to be more legitimate than he is. Leave it at ten floors and give me the building materials and let me go off into the sunset. It's only going to be another person's day. Your nirvana is another person's grave. What then? What to be gained, what to be learned, what to be lost, what to be given. It's clearer in opium dens for all the smog. There is no more pretense. It is lost. And you're there in the purgatory. You're there in the waiting room. And all you can do is tell the truth because the lies have eaten everything and they're done. Select the conversations 
dough like vintages of wine, bits of soapstone cast carelessly by along the Hope. shores that he would never walk with currency. Pieces of once rough and smooth planet by bank accounts to see with words. Coming with all those words like across borders of the ends after the to let them last. take root within until they themselves bred action. They had crawled through galleries, virtues to ponder in vacuums on the grassy ledges. Measurements they had laid, breathing their eggs, thermometers, which now hatched and told him stories. They became the Christmas stories. They became the revolving planetoid. The past was beyond. Stinging at his brain, the past was a dream. The sharp the future was lost where her hot the future breath was would shatter the cold to be glass of his thoughts. Because all such lines which extend to the distant room are in reality only line segments. What the hell? Could he, in turn, it had made him provide her a beyond the scope that others part to his imagination. In such familiar institutions, what the hell could he, in this religion, of such corrupt institutions, beyond the range of his dreams, as religion, politics, the acknowledgement of the blackness which was there, for some place in it itself, the tapestry like a cocoon, which had ensnared him. Something imperfect had woven those threads around him. Would it be found in the silence of forests? Would it be found in the icy death of snow? Could the mountains speak to him? The echoes of the valleys drifting up to the carved hills. They held no answer. Lonely cries of birds and wolves, which had known the summer, which had grown coats in anticipation of the hardship and the famine. He'd strip away layers until he became more human. And what was left of the other sphere of humanity that he had envisioned had it really fractured itself? Had it broken upon the shores as if driven by a harsh wave of uncertain intent? Crystalline fragments of it still were to be found embedded in the sand of memory Anticipations. What he reviewed silently, as the sirens' calls can only be heard between his ears, for the ants of summer had laid their eggs. What he heard then was ticking as a radiator cools. What he had hoped for within the jostling, the maelstrom, the crowd.
crowd, the antics, the semantics, the aesthetics, were vaporized for him to inhale and exhale and pass on only a conduit, only a receptor, only a transceiver and transcriber. Yet, yet, enough. When the call had come, and the time had ended, when the mythological clock in the sky chimed that final hour, he wanted to look back on the days aligned, their links punctuated by action, their strength not within the monetary things, but within the adherence to principle and courage and loyalty and beliefs even if proven wrong yet steadfast yet true the nomenclature of his conscience Reflecting the hard, cold light. After a while, they needed more and more volunteers to escort the cargo to other recipients. What they had to offer was valued on countless worlds. Many people felt we had elevated our stature in the galaxy simply by being ambassadors for the trek. The clone program started on Earth during the uneasy time of increased sterilization was abandoned and people seemed more than willing to forget about us. We came to symbolize a dark strain of regret. Our suppliers were ever expanding and one day, they actually needed more volunteers than we had. Many didn't think this would be a problem. They expected it to be handled gracefully and with understanding. By this time, a few hundred thousand volunteers were already away from Earth. But what resulted from this was the first ultimatum. Either we recruited people for them or they would reduce our supply of trek. Finally, the gloves had come off. There wasn't any real fighting it though. Two thirds of our population was trek dependent. All they needed were a few hundred thousand more custodians. You could see the universe on their freighters. Lonely, cavernous shells which roam the astral coldness like rogue sharks. Selling something derived from what were merely mold spores on their home world, in a location no one but them would ever know. Thanks.